Alright, welcome to the slideshow on suctioning. Uh, so you guys should have already gone over this with therapeutics. I mean, most of you probably already did suctioning in your clinical rotation as well. So a lot of this should be just a straight review for you. Uh, so suctioning with artificial airways is a lot more common because their inability to cough is usually one of our big issues, especially if they have spinal cord injury or a neuromuscular patient or they're on a ventilator. Um, it's harder for them to actually close their glottis when they have an artificial airway, whether it's the trach or an ET tube. If they can't close the glottis, they can't get the back pressure to cough something out. Well, there's a little bit of difference here if we cap a trach or if we if the cuff's deflated, or if you put a passe mirror on a trach and the cuff's deflated, hopefully. Um, with both of those, uh, then that can easily help with back pressure and cough. And that's why a lot of these hospitals will have protocols with trach patients where if their um, cuff is deflated, they might have to either be capped or wear a PMV. Uh, it's just very hard for someone if they do have their cuff deflated or if their cuff's inflated uh, to develop a back pressure or that glottic closure to develop enough pressure to get an effective cough to clear secretion. So it's very important uh, that we are able to help these patients with a cough if they're a trach patient because if they don't have that cough they're just going to retain secretions and have high chance for pulmonary infections and a lower quality of life and it could even lead to a shorter life um, as well. So even with the Craig patient population, as much as we could get their cuff deflated and on a passe mirror, we would, uh, as long as their x-rays weren't getting worse, their requirements weren't getting worse, then we would still, even if they're a known aspirator, we would still deflate the cuff and put a passe mirror on because they need to develop that throat movement. They need to develop their, their tracheal movement for the swallow. So that's, if we leave the cuff up, then they won't develop that muscle movement, they won't develop that muscle whatsoever, and then they won't ever be able to get off or even decannulate it down the road. So it's a very, very big thing. So if we ever want to decannulate a patient, we need them to develop that swallowing motion. And if the cuff's inflated, they cannot do that upward swallowing motion. If you put your hand over your thyroid membrane, cricothyroid membrane right now, and you do a swallowing gulping motion, like you're drinking water, you'll feel that the, that area moves up and back. And if the, there's a something stuck in there that has this balloon inflated it's going to prevent it from moving and therefore you'll have atrophy of that that area and so for them to talk again for them to cough for them to eat and drink and for them to uh, hopefully get away from wearing or having a trach then that would be the end goal for a lot of these patients and we can't do that if we just leave that cuff up. So secretion management is going to be one of our big things with artificial airways, whether it's a tracheostomy tube and or an endotracheal tube. Uh, suctioning, if there's retained secretions that will increase airway resistance and make it work harder for them to breathe, uh, obviously it closes off respiratory zones, so you're going to have hypoxemia and hypercarbia. They're going to have closed off lung tissue, which is going to help atelectasis, which means the lung compliance is going to be low. And they'll also have a high chance for developing an infection. Usually this infection is pneumonia, right? There's these microbes that can't get out of the airway. And they grow in culture in that warm, dark, humid environment. And that's when they develop that. Uh, so retained secretions are a big ordeal, so we need to make sure if a patient is starting to develop atelectasis on their x-ray and starting to have higher oxygen requirements or ventilation requirements, their compliance is going down that we need to evaluate for airway clearance therapy, whether that's through suction, through bronch, through uh, an airway clearance device like a vest or um, pneumatic percussion or through a metaneb, like we need to make sure there's something that we're doing to help prevent those secretions from being retained, that we're helping clear those secretions. Uh, they might have difficulty clearing secretions, so it may not be due to the thickness of the secretions, the tenacity of it, but the uh, amount or the ability to generate a cough might be something out there too. If they have a, a large amount they might have to clear, they may not be able to do it very easily. Uh, but if they have 
muscle weakness, um, like a spinal cord injury patient or anything like that, that's something we have to be aware of and understand uh, ALS patients, things like that. Um, they might not be able to generate that cough and they need to develop that down the road. So that could be an issue as well why we might have to do airway clearance therapy that could involve suctioning on these patients. Traditionally with spinal cord injury patients, if you can, there's been evidence that supports the cough assist in this patient population, really helping out and preventing a lot of issues compared to suctioning alone on them, but we'll get to that later. Artificial airways indications for suctioning. If the breath sounds or chorus, we're not talking about distal, we're talking about more centrally located chorus. So if you listen in the apices, you hear that snore type sound, right? Like that deep tone snoring sound. That's going to be a sign that, hey, they have loose, thick secretions or loose secretions that are hanging out there. Um, that might be an indication to suction because the airways are pretty superior in their airway. If it's distal, right, you hear those crackles and it's not over their central airways. It's pretty uh, much in their basis uh, uh, suctioning through the ET tube or their trach tube is not a good idea because we're not going to go past too far past that airway if we at all. Uh, if they have the inability to generate a cough, uh, then we need to suction them. If the secretions are noted. Chest x-ray shows retained secretions. We need to come up with a game plan. It doesn't mean we just go ahead and suction them. Hey, the x-ray shows retained secretions. Let's go suction them. Because chest x-ray may not show retained secretions. It shows opacities, which people think of secretions. And in fact, it might be swelling or inflammation. right? So that's something that is variable there. Uh, if their ventilator pressures start to change, and you guys will learn about this hopefully very soon, uh, if their peak pressures of the ventilator, or how much pressure it takes to deliver breath, goes up, but their plateau pressures, or how much pressure it takes just to keep sort of the alveoli open, stays the same, then that's an increase in airway resistance, which means it's probably something like secretions or bronchospasm that's going on, um, or King ET tube, where they're biting on the ET tube. Something like that's going on. So if you see their peak pressures on the ventilator go up, and they're in volume mode, and they see the peak pressures go up, that's a sign that there's might be secretions in their airway. So that's something that we will think about. Uh, visible secretion in the ET tube, that's the easiest one of all. I had that happen with my daughter where uh, there was, she had a ET tube, uh, my first daughter, and she had the ET tube in, and she was starting to braiding and disat. And there was a visible secretion in her ET tube, and the RT was walking through. I'm like, oh, can you suction her real quick? Because she's struggling with that. And he's like, I can't. I'm not allowed to. And then walks away. And I'm like, oh, well, I won't talk about that here. But um, the, I was able to get a nurse, of all people, a nurse to go do that, um, which was quite interesting. So if you see secretions in the ET tube, that's indication to suction. Uh, if the person is aspirating, uh, for some reason or another, they have some sort of aspiration that's gone on. Like, let's say they have a trach tube, and they aspirated around their trach tube a bunch of food that they weren't supposed to eat, and their trach tube uh, somehow got deflated by them um, magically when no one else was in the room, and they were trying to eat, and they aspirated a ton of fluid. So that might be an indication to go in a bunch of food and fluid. Uh, might be go ahead and go in there to suction. If we need to obtain a specimen like a tracheal aspirate or a uh, sputum sample, it, technically it would be a tracheal aspirate if it's an artificial airway. And finally, atelectasis from secretions. Once again, that's something that we can't really... We see atelectasis on their x-ray, they have lots of secretions, and we think it's atelectasis from secretions. That can be an indication to suction. Uh, doesn't mean that we're just on a scheduled thing going in every two to four hours and suctioning. Suction is always PRN. It is always PRN. It is always PRN. It is never something that is scheduled. If it is scheduled, that is an inappropriate order. That is something I would clarify that uh, if we need other airway clearance adjuncts, then just suction uh, at that point. Um, 
but it is always a PRN thing. So if you do not hear coarse breath sounds, but they do have signs of atelectasis and their secretions are just not coming up, well, is that indication to go ahead and suction? Absolutely not, because you're not going to get it. So you need to have those airway therapy, clearance air therapy adjuncts like a metaneb or vest or so on and so forth, or a medication that helps um, thin out some of those secretions. Contraindications to suctioning. There's no absolute contraindications to suctioning. You need to watch out for adverse reactions. So pulmonary edema, I will tell you the people will have high pressures. They'll be coughing. Everybody thinks that they're having a lot of issues there. Uh, the big thing here is you need to make sure uh, that you are judicious uh, or stingy, I should say, with your suctioning in these patients because when you go down, if you go down past the ET tube, if the catheter goes past the ET tube, which hopefully if it does, it won't go more than a centimeter past it, but if it does and strikes the airway, then that can cause more inflammation and more edema, uh, which could then make their pulmonary edema even worse. So, be careful when you're looking at this. Well, why? What's going on with this patient? You, hopefully, you can derive, de derive, right? Hopefully, you can figure out with the care team what's going on with the patient and what the best situation is here. Uh, watching for adverse reactions is one of the big things because uh, not only are you sucking um, secretions, hopefully, but you're also sucking gas and ventilation oxygen, all that stuff out of the airway. So that's why pre-oxygenation, or in the NICU world, pre-ventilation is going to be one of your big things. So complications, obviously hypoxia, because uh, you're sucking out oxygen, right? Tracheal trauma, especially if you do it where a bunch of those generationally advanced respiratory therapists and some new grads are 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 uh, have their hands guilty of this as well. They'll go in and they'll keep jabbing the, the tracheal catheter in until the patient starts gagging and coughing. Um, that's a sign that you've been hitting the airway and stabbing and causing trauma to the airway. And I highly recommend against that practice. If that's what it takes to get the secretions, then maybe we can discuss alternate airway clearance therapies than suctioning. Uh, like the cough assist or the metaneb or, you know, start with pharmacologies that can help with airway clearance. Um, so you can actually be a part of the tracheal trauma. Yeah. Um, so please do not stab coronas. Vagal them down. Unless they're an SVT that's not responding to anything else. I mean, you could try it, I guess. Uh, cardiac or respiratory arrest. Absolutely, right? Because you're causing hypoxemia. You, cause, you can cause a vagal maneuver. This is why I don't recommend going a centimeter past, more than a centimeter past the end of the uh, artificial airway. Arrhythmias, of course, uh, especially if you're doing uh, tickling things, you can cause ectopic uh, issues and cause them to go into an SVT or a VTAC. Uh, not great. <laughs> Atelectasis, of course, because you're sucking gas out of their lungs, and therefore that you're sucking pressure and gas out of the lungs, and therefore there's less pressure to distend the respiratory zone. Of course, bronchospasm, if you hit their airway and stab their airway, uh, of course that, that muscle, that sensitive protection mechanism will be triggered um, because you're stabbing their airway. You're causing that trauma. Do not stab airway. Do not. Uh, infection, of course, especially if you're using open suction versus a Ballard suction system. Thank goodness for Ballards. Uh, hemorrhaging, of course, especially if the airways are very um, are already damaged to begin with. You can make it uh, so where it bleeds quite expeditiously. Unfortunately, if their platelets are low, that could be something. There are burn victims. All these things can all play a role in here. Uh, hyper hypotension can be a cause here. Hypotension, especially if you're stabbing carina where the vagus nerve is. Hypertension, if you're causing high vent pressures and it's backing, back pressuring the heart, uh, just say no, right? Uh, vagal stimulation is one of the huge things because people like to go in until the patient starts coughing or gagging and they think that's a good thing. And I will tell you now, please do not do that in your practice, please. <laughs> assessment of need, uh, you need to suction, uh, root, uh, <laughs> need for suction routine as needed. So this is where you're just going to assess them, 
do they need it or do they not? Do you hear it in there? Do you see their pressures changing? Do you see it in their tube? Do you see it there? Then maybe you suction or attempt to suction. If you do not see those things and you do not have indication to do so, then I would recommend to you maybe you wait and assess them further. Um, Every once in a while before I would take a patient on transport from the ICU to CT or MRI or any of those places, I would suction before I lift. Uh, most of the time that wouldn't yield much, but most of the time when you start to transport a patient, you'll hit bumps in the road on the way over to MRI or CT and then you inevitably have to suction them because that knocks some secretions loose that weren't loose before. So even then it wasn't something that was clear out their whole lungs with just, you know, your little suction valor. That's not something that typically happens unless they have a strong cough that they spontaneously give you during the suction, not you inducing it by stabbing their crina into raw meat. Uh, assessment of outcome. Uh, so remember, this is something you assess for the need of. It's not something that's scheduled. You assess the need of it. Assessment of outcome. Uh, after you suction, you want to listen. Uh, do you have louder breath sounds? Do you hear more air moving? Did you get secretions out? What color are they? What happened to your patient's ventilating pressures? Did they lower after you removed all those secretions? Uh, if you removed a lot of secretions from an airway clearance therapy and you drew an ABG, uh, the, did they have a better ventilation and oxygenation? ultimately. So uh, one thing you've got to be concerned about is if you start to see them go into this rhythm, hopefully you recognize that rhythm as VTAC. And so that could be a sign that you uh, should have high uh, pre-oxygenated that patient. Uh, so pre-oxygenation is going to be one of your big things to help their heart if they, if they do get hypoxic with suctioning, help them recover they do get hypoxic with suctioning or have lots of issues with suctioning, adverse reactions to it, then you might want to consider going down on your suction pressure or do intermittent suctioning as you um, withdraw the catheter um, as well. Uh, so pre-oxygenation as well as some of these people if they have hypercarbia to begin with, you might need to give them a couple of spontaneous breaths uh, to do it as well. But please do not do not be stabbing crying or airway wall. And also that squirting sailing down the airway. We'll talk about that, but that is drowning your patient is never appropriate therapy. There's other more effective ways that do not cause trauma and damage to the patient. And throwing a bunch of saline down their artificial airway is a good way to cause damage and harm, which violates that whole Hippocratic Oath thing about, you know, doing no harm. All right, suctioning. Always monitor their heart rates. Uh, if they start to go down, start to go tacky, stop, right? Stop. Pull it out of their airway. Let them oxygen levels come back up. Let them go back to baseline. If they start having a very adverse reaction to it, stop, right? Do not continue. I don't care if you found a good pocket in there and you're just getting a gallon of fluid out. Uh, you stop. You stop. You let them recover. Uh, that's a big, big thing. Let them recover. So you're watching them, you're making sure they're on monitor, that you're checking their heart rate. Um, pre and post breath sounds, of course, you're going to chart this as well. Respiratory rate, if you do resolve it, you should see a decrease in the respiratory rate because you resolved a work of breathing. Their oxygenation should, of course, improve. Blood pressure should, of course, uh, if they were in a stressful situation, their blood pressure actually might come down after removing a lot of secretions, and I'm not talking about vagaling them, I'm talking about you remove something that was causing a lot of distress, you actually might see the blood pressure come back down closer to normal from a hypertensive state. Same thing with the heart rate, it might actually slow down a bit, even if you know you didn't vagal them. That would be because you took stress off of them, like they were working hard to breathe through all those secretions. Vent pressure before and after, of course, that's something that we would look at. Uh, Record sputum color, consistency, the amount. Uh, smell's not something I ever charted unless it was noted, <laughs> unless it was significant, unless it's something that you could detect. Uh, but color, absolutely, every time. 
uh, if color starts changing, that could be a sign of different organisms growing, so on and so forth. How thick or thin it is, that's a big thing that we look at before we start to extubate, or if we, if it's still thick and we have good humidity and we're doing uh, good, uh, if we're fluid uh, even with our eyes and nose, then that's something we might look at giving them uh, different medicines to help them with that as well. Uh, we should record their tolerance. In other words, patient tolerated well. Uh, no rope distress noted. We'll assess for further evaluation or further intervention. Uh, so you always need to chart tolerance after you do a procedure. So it's like doing pre and post breast sounds after an EB. How well did they tolerate it? Right? What changed, if anything? That's exactly what you're doing here. So suction is one of those procedures that you're going to do this. All right, types of catheters that are out there. Um, the whistle tips, you'll see down there. Uh, Argyle, Airflow, the Cade, uh, which is designed specifically for suctioning a main stem. That's a whole separate thing. Um, when we're talking especially about spinal cord injury patients or specialty things, the most common one that you will be uh, uh, looking at here is these closed systems, the Ballard systems. So that's one of the things that we pay close attention to here is these Ballard systems when we're looking at artificial airways because this means we don't have to disconnect them from the ventilator or from anything at all. Um, and it gives them continuous oxygenation. And if they're hooked up to a ventilation ventilator, a continuous ventilation as well throughout the whole suction procedure. Uh, so there's no interruption, oxygenation, and or ventilation other than the catheter itself that we put down there, artificial airway. Also, it helps reduce the risk of infection because it never gets touched by us uh, each individual time. <laughs> uh, so it's a lot more valuable in this situation. We have Ballard's closed su system suctions for neonates that are using little two and a half ET tubes all the way up through an adult. So Ballards are an amazing help. Please make sure if you're using these Ballards, you're not just using them uh, judiciously to the point where you're just going until you hit them and cause a cough. That could be a very bad thing, right? No stabbing cryness. Uh, equipment needed to suction. Obviously you need a suction source, so you need a vacuum and a collection container. Uh, yeah, I've had uh, people hook up suction at codes before and like, okay, you got suction. I'm like, okay, I have suction. And it's not hooked up to anything besides the vacuum itself. And obviously that vacuum only had one use left in it. Uh, sterile suction catheters, you want to look at once half the internal diameter and then usually the next size down. Um, yeah. And sterile gloves, saline, a basin, this is for the open equipment, obviously, mask, gown, gloves. Uh, you don't want them, their trach, especially patient, coughing into you. Auction supplies for pre and post, but what if their auction requirements get worse? Do you have a plan for that, right? If they stop breathing and they go into respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest, uh, do you have an ambu bag and mask in the room or very, very close by if, they, if something bad happens? If they start massively bleeding, do you have a plan for that? Do you know what their platelets are, right? So these are things that you need to be prepared for. So not only that, but how much suction pressure you're going to use? Are you just going to turn it to max and call it good and cause more, ad have higher chance of adverse reactions? Uh, or is this person not tolerating it well and you're going to turn the suction pressure down or use intermittent suctioning or spend longer pre-oxygenating or pre-ventilate with a couple of breaths? So uh, procedure. Uh, so that's the need for suctioning. We're not just going to blindly go in. Every time I see a patient, I'm just going to suction. No, that's not correct. That's You have to have an indication or a need to do it. If it comes down the road that you sent a person to VTAC that did not ultimately recover, that went to VFib, that then coded, right, that did not recover, they're going to ask you why you suctioned. What was your indication? And if you say that's just what I do and that's what other people do, you are not going to be in a good place, right? Uh, so you need to assess the need for that suctioning. Assemble and check equipment, so make sure the suction's working. Um, yeah, we've had a couple things happen like that before. 
people will tell me, hey, the suction's set up and we're going to go intubate this patient. And I check the equipment and I'm like, I don't hear it, right? You don't hear or feel the suction. Uh, they just have it hooked up and that's what they were trying to communicate with you, even though your receptive uh, thought was that it was ready to go. Um, Preoxygenate, hyperinflate if you if it is safe to do so. So not necessarily hyperinflate anymore, but preventilate. Uh, so preoxygenate is usually common for uh, a pediatric through adult patients. We'll just increase their FI2 to 100%. Uh, it usually lasts for about two minutes, and then you can go ahead and go in and suction. Neonates, usually if you do preoxygenate in the NICU, you'll do it by 10%. So let's say a baby's on 25%, you'll hit the little preoxygenate button and it'll go to 35%, right? So you'll do it by 10% uh, changes for preoxygenation. Most of the time for those little guys, though, we won't necessarily preoxygenate, uh, even though it is only a 10% FI2 change, but it will preventilate instead. So we'll do a couple of manual breaths, which is a button that's on your most mechanical ventilators out there. So we'll use that. Um, so preoxygenate, preventilate. Uh, if you're using open system sterile technique, even though there's nothing sterile about the airway because it's always exposed to the atmosphere, but we're still using sterile technique. Uh, insert the catheter. Uh, it says here insert to resistance, uh, withdraw to centimeters in suction. I will say do not do that. Um, so you're going to insert. Uh, you should know how long the tracheostomy tube is because you should have a spare trach at the bedside, the same size, and it says on the trach box how long the trach is. Well, we know the trachs should be roughly one to three centimeters above the carina, so just add a centimeter to that maybe. Maybe. Uh, and then you know how far to go with this open system. Uh, here it says withdrawal two centimeters. Well, this was originally written when the artificial air was supposed to be two to four centimeters above the carina. So that means they went into a main stem uh, with is what their resistance that they met or the carina. And then they pulled back into the ET tube or into the trach tube. So I'm just telling you, hey, you know how long the ET tube is. You know how long the trach tube is. Just add one centimeter to that, if that, and you'll be in the same position this is saying. Uh, so when you apply suction, you only apply suction while removing the catheter. You never do it while inserting the catheter. Uh, you rotate uh, clockwise, counterclockwise, doesn't matter. Uh, your preference here uh, while pulling out uh, and slowly. It should uh, suction for no more than 15 seconds. Longer than that can easily cause even more chance for adverse reaction. The procedure itself, if the patient has an adverse reaction, they start getting tachycardic. Bradycardic uh, blood pressure starts to increase, blood pressure starts to decrease. Uh, they start throwing an arrhythmia on the monitor. Uh, stop immediately. That's a big issue. And expect me to test you on this. I will test you on this. All right. I will test you on this. Hopefully you all got that. Um, Reoxygenate if this does happen, uh, pull out. Uh, Reoxygenate, reventilate on the until they stabilize. Uh, assess the outcome. Do I need to go back in again, or was that enough to call it good? Should we do a different therapy? Yeah, that's a pretty big ordeal. Closed system. I love Ballard's. They are helpful in many ways. Uh, they're great for people that have high ventilation requirements. They are standard of practice for mechanical ventilation nowadays, thank goodness. Um, because there's continuous oxygenation and ventilation, the whole time suctioning is going on, it decreases adverse reactions with these patients. Uh, the patient needs frequent suctioning, so let's say someone's on a T-piece. Uh, uh, I love T-pieces in one aspect because they have a Ballard system. Uh, we're using the Ballard as the T-piece most of the time. And so we don't have to worry as much about people, different people's differing techniques. Uh, better for pe people that are more hemodynamically unstable because there's no change in thoracic pressure. So if someone has congestive heart failure, they need high mean airway pressures if their heart is sick 
They need high mean airway pressures and they need high thoracic pressures to help reduce the stretch of the heart and therefore reduce the workload of the heart. So if we take them off of the ventilator and there's less thoracic pressure, that means their heart expands more and therefore has to work harder when it squeezes and therefore it might actually cause their heart to actually get sicker or their congestive heart failure to get worse. So for hemodynamically unstable patients, changing the thoracic pressure could be a very, very bad thing. That even means switching them from vent to vent to go to CT or MRI scans. So that's something that we can talk about down the road as well. But hemodynamically unstable patients, we need to keep that thoracic pressure stable. Uh, active tuberculosis, of course, if someone has an infection, uh, we're all over the news right now. If someone has an infection, yeah, you don't want to expose yourself to everything or everybody in the room to everything that patient is breathing. This system allows you to do a closed system where you're not exposing everybody. Uh, if a patient's receiving a gas mixture with nitric or heliox or any of those special gas mixtures too, this is going to be more beneficial because you don't have to disrupt those pharmacological interventions while you're doing this. So you're not losing pressure, no loss of EPAP or PEEP. Uh, you're, you have less risk of cross-contamination because it's a closed system, a lot less risk of hypoxia uh, because they're getting continuous ventilation and oxygenation. One of the major issues I see here is um, people, there's this little button that you push if you've never used one of these before. Uh, this little button here that you push. Uh, you will see people that um, will leave that button somewhere where it can get caught in, the, in between bed railings in a bed and it can be continuously suck, uh, in suction. Or you'll see people that forget to pull somehow leave most of the catheter or some of the catheter still in their airway, artificial airway, um, forget to pull it all the way back or retract it all the way back into its sleeve and leave the room and then that increases air resistance of course because now there's a tube stuck in their airway. Uh, NT suction uh, indications, NT suction be very very careful. Uh, whenever I did this I was super careful on the if we were doing floor therapy, we always had to order, have an order. If we were doing ICU therapy, we didn't have to have an order. Um, the floors, especially if they're on drugs because of uh, any type of blood thinners, so if they have AFib or anything like that, that's something we need to know. I need to know what their platelets are too. Uh, the nose is very vascular, and if you stick a catheter up there, you can cause a very severe nosebleed very, very quickly. Um, so that's one of the huge issues that we can have here. So NT suctioning, uh, if they cannot clear the secretions and there's no artificial airway, uh, NT suction is an option uh, if they have an infective or absent cough in the presence of secretions, something we could uh, use. Uh, even Hayek Medical, that negative pressure, uh, that chest caress thing out there, has airway clearance uh, part to it, and that's something we can talk about later. Uh, if someone has low platelets and they still need it, then I recommend a nasal trumpet or a nasal airway, nasal pharyngeal airway. Drop one of those in, then NT suction through the nasal pharyngeal airway. Uh, so if someone has a lot of issues or low platelets or really needs it and you have lots of risk there, I would recommend the trumpet placement first and then NT suctioning. Contraindications. Uh, if their nasal passages are occluded or if there's active nose bleeding, uh, don't do it. If there's lots of facial injuries or coagulopathy issues, uh, don't do it. If their throat's actively spasming and they're irritated upper airway, they have an irritated upper airway, that just can make the situation worse. So do not do it. Uh, if they have an upper respiratory tract infection and you try to NT suction, you, are, you have the possibility of spreading that infection to their lungs. I know some of you think job security, but uh, that's a very inappropriate thought. Uh, so please do not spread infection. Uh, complications, of course, hypoxia, trauma, 
is the biggest one that I'm usually worried about. Respiratory cardiac arrest, uh, uh, not as common. Uh, trauma, it's a lot more common. Pain, of course. Uh, do you want people anti-suctioning you? If you, if you do, uh, I think you need to ha get some help for that. Arrhythmias, of course. Uh, bradycardia is a uh, vagal stimulation, atelectasis from too much, bronchospasm from stabbing too much to the airway, infection from spreading it, gagging of course, uh, and vomiting, especially that gag uh, reflex in the back of the nose. Uh, if you're anti-suctioning or oral tracheal suctioning, that can be a big issue. Always auscultate for the need as needed. It is not scheduled per doctor's order. Notice that uh, this is not the first time that I've stated this. Uh, I would remember that. Assessment outcome, make sure uh, you assess how well they tolerated it, um, how effective was it, how much do you get, moderate, mild, scant, uh, large, <laughs> copious amount, right? Listen to the breath sounds. Uh, did you hear an improvement? No, right? Uh, nasal tracheal suctioning, make sure you're monitoring everything because everything could still change skin color we're not talking about race here we're talking about did they uh, have any issues where they braided or it could be a sign of perfusion could be a sign of um, hypoxemia as well so that's what you're looking for here is perfusion right do they get all mottled and purple <laughs> or did they get um, Synodic, acrocynotic, right? Did they have some sort of issue there? Uh, so that's what you're looking at there. So we need to record the color, the consistency, amount, smell if it's there. Um, what, did they have a strong cough? Was there a cough absent? Uh, I will tell you if we're weaning someone and then I do oral care and they do not have a gag reflex. With the oral care and all that stuff, that's always a bad sign of airway protection. But doesn't mean we can't do it, just something we need to chart and notify the rest of the team about. So how strong their cough is. If there was bleeding, we need to chart it and note it. That's something everybody needs to know. Any adverse reactions to tachypnea, tachycardia, uh, bradyapnea, bradycardia, so on and so forth. Uh, so what? how well did they tolerate it? Was there any adverse reactions? Or you could chart no adverse reactions noted. RT will reevaluate. Um, NT suction the procedure. You need to gather equipment, get them pre oxygenated, uh, lubricate the catheter, of course, uh, water soluble, you know, we're using petroleum based, of course. Clean technique or sterile technique. Gently insert the catheter into the nair through the septum along the floor of the concha or the floor of the navel cavity. Nasal cavity so as low as you can has the most open space. Uh, like I said, if a patient has low platelets or on blood thinners, then I might consider uh, asking the care team or whoever's making the decision on NT suctioning uh, what their thoughts are on putting a trumpet or a nasal pharyngeal airway in and then anti-suctioning through that to help avoid trauma and damage and all that stuff. Usually the trumpets can go in pretty easily if you use a small enough size and a lot less damaging to the nasal pharyngeal cavity there. If you do it right. Uh, <laughs> continue through resistance, this is correct, because the resistance that you're feeling there is the vocal cords, the epiglottis, which are naturally going to be uh, closed or try to prevent something from entering. You tell the patient to take a deep breath in. <gasps> Once they start taking that deep breath in, not wait till they take the deep breath in, but wait till they start. Once they start taking that breath in, advance the catheter. Right? You're not waiting till they're done <gasps> with the breath in and then inserting it. You're waiting until they start it, the breath in. <gasps> Right, that first part of it, and that's when you insert or advance the catheter. That means it'll go through the glottis and hopefully you will enter to the appropriate depth. Well, how do you know how deep to go with an NT suction? Well, this is where you measure from the nose or the nair to the tragus, and then from the tragus to the angle of Louis on the sternum, which is the second rib area. That way you know how far to go. So it's always calculated. 
you know that that's roughly where the crina would be. So you just subtract one centimeter from there. And you're good. Good time. All right. Uh, as far as uh, sputum samples, they might ask for a sputum sample um, or a tracheal aspirate. This is where you might need what's called a Lucan's trap. Uh, so this is where you put the suction catheter. Uh, you put this in line with the suction catheter and the suction tubing. So this side here attaches to the suction tubing, and this side here attaches to your suction catheter. The big thing with these is you got to make sure that they stay upright. So if it lays down like this, somehow during the maneuver or while everything's still attached, some of that mucus or whatever you suctioned out could easily be sucked through this guy that's hooked up to the tubing and to the canister, and then you might actually lose your sample and it's all gone and then it's empty and then you'd have to do that procedure all over again. Uh, not great, especially if the patient did not tolerate it well. So these are gravity dependent. So make sure the bottom of these is always pointed down. Cough assist. I love these cough assists. Uh, there are even ventilators now for spinal cord injury patients that have been in Europe for five years because they don't have an FDA. Um, they have a, actually a cough assist integrated with the ventilator and why I think that actually may be the future of almost every mechanical ventilator on the market. Uh, thank goodness. But uh, I'm like, why don't more of them have it? These are great for patients that have an ineffective or cannot cough on their own. Sounds like most of our mechanical ventilation patients. Um, so spinal cord injury patients are your big patient population with this currently. Um, it will be a quick inflation with positive pressure and then switch from positive pressure to negative pressure. Uh, and this generates really, really high flows that are positive then to negative. And it's very similar intrapulmonarily to a natural cough. Uh, you do not get that pause or that back compression that you would with a cough, that valsalva, that closure of the glottis but it does a pretty darn good job um, overall. The benefits, it's very, very safe. It's non-invasive. We're not jamming a catheter in there. Uh, home care, people can use this at home. Family can use this with their family members. Uh, it can be used very easily. Of course, these are old pictures of the old version of the cough assist. The new one looks much more technologically advanced. Um, they're non-invasive. They can actually give us values. The newer one actually gives us values on their lung function and how much, how well they're doing. They're very easy to use. Uh, they are used for home care patients. Uh, they're used just in generally because instead of suctioning, let's say they have lots of retained secretions, we just do five coughs and then we suction after that. So it can help those secretions mobilize without us having to worry about it being high enough to suction. So. These are great devices, and I'm very glad that more and more RTs and more and more places are very open to them. And you can use these uh, kid through adults. Uh, I even have a kid with uh, kyphoscoliosis and a lot of other things going on. And I was able to get her approved for one of these at home, and she would come in with the hospital in our PICU with pneumonia every year, at least a couple of times a year. And so I got her set up with one of these for home use, and she's just stopped coming in. Uh, she would spend usually about a year to two years between coming in. And, and when she did come in to our PICU, it was mostly because of a wound care uh, thing. It wasn't really because of a pneumonia like she was getting because uh, they were being prophylactic with the cough assist. So I'm a big fan of the cough assist. I hope you guys are too. Um, the settings here, this is obviously very old version of it, but you can manually switch it from inhale to exhale. You can do a longer I time, E time. You can auto big it. Um, so inhale, exhale, how long to pause, uh, how much pressure you can use on inhale versus exhale, the flow changes. So there's a lot of good, valuable changes you can do with the cough assist on these patients. And hopefully if you haven't played with one before, you'll get to play with one soon.